So it's no secret that the going is tough for open source uh, uh, projects and specifically the monetization aspects around open source. Uh, the business models are complex. There are excellent projects that have you know, not been sustainable like RethinkDBs and ones that have had to close source some of their code like InfluxDB. Um, and it's really a complicated undertaking. Uh, not only you know, is it a competitive landscape out there, there's you know, diversity of business models, there's the distro model, um, there are disruptors that come in all the time. Um, and after all the dust settles, the code is wide open. And uh, anybody can take it and have it and do whatever they want with it. Uh, and they do. Um, and AWS is known to be a beast at rolling out services like that. Um, they take open source projects um, that become popular um, and they have a large market share, roll out managed services, and uh, it becomes difficult for the smaller open source projects to compete with that kind of a model. Um, and they're not alone with that. Facebook has a huge MySQL operation that they've created a custom distro for that they haven't contributed back to the community with. And this has become like kind of a trend and I'd like to explore what you know, open source uh, can do in order to kind of combat this kind of competitive landscape, the d diversity of business models out there. Um, kind of uh, ask my panel of experts here um, to give some insight onto how you know, the open source can continue to thrive uh, in such a um, competitive and complex uh, business landscape. So I'm Sharon Zitzman. I lead the OpenStack community in Israel, I lead the DevOps community in Israel, I lead the Cloudify community, uh, and open source is near and dear to my heart. Uh, I'm actually stepping in for Nati Shalom, our fearless CTO, who couldn't be here, so I hope I do this panel justice. Uh, so without further ado, I want to introduce my excellent panel of experts here uh, that have quite a track record in the open source sphere. Um, they are much more knowledgeable on, than me on this topic, and I'd like to hear their insight on uh, where, you, where they think that, that all this is going and how we can uh, you know, thrive in the open source sphere. So uh, we have uh, Monty Taylor, uh, former PTL of the infrastructure project uh, at OpenStack, uh, one of the core developers and former on, formerly on the board. I'll allow you to introduce yourself and uh, highlight the key aspects and the things that are near and dear to your heart in the open source sphere. I, uh... So hi, yeah, I'm, I'm Monty. I, I basically have no voice left because it's Wednesday. Uh, <laughs> and that's how that works. Uh, yeah, as um, as Sean said, I, uh, uh, I've been around OpenStack for quite some time, um, uh, generally speaking since before it was OpenStack, so, uh, so quite, quite a while. Um, uh, as long as it is humanly possible to, to be associated with the project. Um, I also sit on the technical committee, uh, and, um, and in addition to the other things, uh, I don't know what's near and dear to my heart. Um, I, it, before uh, before OpenStack, it, I, I worked on MySQL actually, and I and I'm gonna I'm gonna disagree with you uh, real briefly just to to make sure that we have a uh, a lively lively panel here. Um, sure. uh, for for whatever it's worth, uh, Mark Callahan and the and the MySQL team at Facebook actually. Uh, have released their their MySQL work as uh, my my rocks DB um, recently. And, uh, no, it's it's been out for a bit. Okay. Um, and uh, and the 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 fun bit there is is that uh, even before being acquired by Sun and then acquired by Oracle, MySQL has had a long history of not taking Mark Callahan's patches okay. going back to when he was at Google. So okay. at this point, he's probably just given up. So I stand corrected, <laughs> but I, there is an ongoing trend of kind of. Oh, totally. Yeah, yeah. No, it's it's a good point in general, but I. Just I just wanted to give Mark a shout out because he, he tried his best when he was at Google to, to get some patches into MySQL and MySQL was just like, nah, we don't care. Okay. Um. <laughs> I can accept that. Alex Friedland, CEO of uh, Mirantis, also has quite a track record and uh, one of the leading distros for OpenStack, has uh, widespread experience with open source projects. Feel free to introduce yourself even further. Thanks. Uh, yes, so uh, we started with OpenStack uh, in April of 2011, when it was already OpenStack, and we've done some projects even before, but we committed to OpenStack um, very early. So Mirantis has become uh, probably one of the leading companies and probably the last standing independent company, I mean, that, that was built around OpenStack. And uh, speaking of business models and monetization, you know, we, we, we came 
close last year to having a nine digit uh, you know uh, revenue stream so there is a way to monetize um, it's challenging and I think the business models constantly evolve and it's ab all about execution and evolving the business models and interestingly I think that um, Amazon um, contrary to the um, people's beliefs is actually the most successful open source company out there because to your God, point this is, is going to be a good panel it is <laughs> successful business wise i'm not suggesting that you know i just don't agree they're an open source company well they are because they're consuming open source that all of us are developing without contributing anything back and then monetizing it as a service yeah, i call the build. leech mm -hmm. so speaking of the business models right so the trick is you know Amazon has educated the world about what's possible and then how do we evolve our business models to not be leeches and still make money. This is what, is, you know, what our life is all about. Indeed. Christian Carrasco, CEO of Umbrella, serial CTO, was a cloud advisor to TapJoin, a few other major organizations. Uh, feel free to introduce yourself further. Yeah, hi guys. Um, yeah, I've been working with open source technologies, uh, I guess since the late 90s, but uh, professionally uh, I started my first company in 2001 and we, it was all open source technologies at the time. And um, it, it's, well, I've seen it evolve uh, and grow. And I've seen people take it and run with it and close it uh, like TiVo. And, um, and we've seen a lot of people uh, do what Amazon's doing right now, but what I really see is um, Amazon's really giving back, uh, in, in their business model, they're giving the engineers what they wanted all along that we didn't provide, which is the ease, the cohesiveness, and, but the way they're doing it is, I consider it sort of like the modern day uh, crack dealer for engineers. And so they give us, uh, and our engineers, uh, these tools that people love, but then um, they can't, uh, when the day they wanna leave, they can't, so you can check out anytime you want, but you can't ever leave. And so you can't just grab your source code because you've, it's got all their logic inside your code. So when you try to leave Amazon to another cloud provider, it's a pretty painful effort. Boom, I'm loving this panel already. This is getting good. And we're just at the introductions. Okay, Arthur Berezin, PM at Cloudify, uh, leading the uh, Apache Aria project as well, formerly at Red Hat, long uh, standing open source experience. Go yeah, ahead. So I've been uh, around open, open source in general and OpenStack, I think, since 2012. Also worked for Reddit for, for a while. And, you know, for me, it sounds like we're trying to understand as our overall industry where, you know, what's the right level of, of competition, where, you know, you see various vendors consuming open source, providing services and selling them to their customers. But, you know, some of them are contributing back to the core project. Some of them are not contributing back. Other, other guys, you know, just contributing a certain portion of it. So again, we're, we're just trying to find out, you know, what's the right level of competing versus, uh, versus uh, collaborating with these vendors and, you know, and, and essentially monetizing because by the end of the day, if open source is not sustainable, again, companies are going to die because they, you know, cannot finance their operations. So that's a key element. I think it's important to us for, for us to solve as an industry. Thank you. And Flavio Percoco, uh, one of the leading developers in the OpenStack community on the technical committee, uh, has been quite an active community member, core maintainer, and has been doing a lot of excellent work in the open source industry. Yeah, so, um, yeah, I'm Flavio. I, I work at, at, at Red Hat. At Red Hat. Um, I think I've been in open source forever. <laughs> open source taught me how to program, actually, and then I started consuming libraries, and then I started contributing to them. And, I'm not Red Hat, and I sit on the technical committee. Uh, I work on OpenStack on many, many different things. And um, sure, I, I agree with some of the things these guys have said so far about collaborating, but I'm not even going to mention this other company because, <laughs> like Monty, I don't agree they do actually open source and um, have um, very strong opinions about how they do things. So strong just going to let you good. lead it. We like strong opinions. Um, so just a snapshot of what uh, Amazon services uh, look like. You know, they roll them out all the time. The, the projects get popular, Hadoops, and now Elasticsearch, et cetera. This is probably a pretty old snapshot is the truth. But uh, they uh, constantly roll out managed services as soon as the project gets a little bit interesting. Um, and generally speaking, just the overall, you know, kind of what I call the disruption cycle 
or what Nati Shalom calls the disruption cycle, um, is that, you know, you get a really cool tool. It struggles to gain adoption. By the time it gets to the point where it's going to make monetization, something else cool comes out, and it kind of disrupts that tool or its competition. And it's already a vicious and tough cycle. And then you have, uh, you know, you have this whole scenario where you have uh, your code wide open, and it becomes o even more difficult. So the most obvious question of all uh, to begin with is, why even go open source? Why is open source important? Um, let's start with why you believe in open source and why you're in this uh, space. So, um, I mean, I'm the I'm the the uh, the typical starry-eyed optimist, although you wouldn't know it from my uh, screaming matches at people at conferences. Um, but I I believe that it's the the ethical thing to do. Um, I think that uh, I think that the um, the world of, of, of engineering and computing uh, as historically built off of, off of the shoulders of the people that, that come before it. Everybody that thinks that they've invented something new and fancy and, and exciting, um, they're full of crap. Um, <laughs> none, of, none of these things are, are, are revolutionary, innovative. They're the next small piece on the shoulder of millions of people that did work before them. Um, but we, we've built um, in our, our culture, like a, a kind of ego worship obsessive uh, 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 thing, where where everybody is, you know, vying for, for for sort of total supremacy at the at the at the cost of everybody else. And I personally, whatever I can do to to I don't know retard that by just a little bit, if I can if I can do that to make users' lives a little bit better. Uh, people who are trying to accomplish things lives a little better. If, if I can accomplish even a shred of that uh, in the in kind of the, the face of the the onslaught of the the the, the gaping maw of the system, <laughs> um, then then that's what I'm going to do. Um, uh, I recognize that that's not necessarily the motivation of of everybody, um, uh, but for me, I would like to leave the world slightly better than it was when I got here. It's beautiful. Go ahead, Alex. So. Um, I actually subscribe to the ethical uh, concepts that Monty just verbalized. Uh, but I add to it another layer because first and foremost, I'm a business person and uh, uh, a pragmatist this way. And um, we are living at a times where the speed of change that is um, happening in front of our eyes is disruptive to our human uh, timelines, because we always were living through the, you know, the exponential change, but I think we're getting to the point compared to our own lives and ability to change as humans that um, we're kind of, you know, at the knee of the curve. And when that happens, um, we have to be able to come up with innovation very, very fast. And the timelines that are required for proprietary people, like take VMware as an example, to build the technology, commercialize and make it large, um, is too slow. And so what that means is you need a huge community to continue to innovate and there is no way to do it in proprietary anymore. And so open source went from being a disruptor of the proprietary solutions of the past to the innovation engine that is bringing uh, in necessary innovation to the world. And it becomes an essential part and that's why the open source revolution is happening. And harnessing it in a commercially viable way is very important because it will continue to fuel the innovation. But, you know, the types of problems we're solving now could not be solved by one company. It requires thousands of people working together with the right ethical approach. So that's kind of where we are in open source, yeah. why it's necessary. I agree. The, the ability to adopt new technology is what fuels innovation, absolutely. Um, uh, basically, to channel Nati's voice, who's not here, it's, uh, <laughs> the only constant is change, right? Uh, yeah. He always says that, and uh, I subscribe to the no lock-in approach, you know, that uh, you guys promote so well. Uh, that whenever we design a solution for our customers, we go and we make sure uh, that it, we create it in such a way that they can move, even if we're not around, and um, and that can only happen if we use open source or open standards. Uh, because it's not just open source, we also have to look at the standards that are coming out. Uh, because open source will eventually define a lot of the standards. Um, and so it, it, it's always, uh, it's, uh, but also as a business person and entrepreneur, it's, 
it's a struggle, right? You have to figure out how do I design something so that my customers aren't locked in, uh, we can benefit together, I can give back to the community, and then at the same time, make money to keep the lights on and pay for the developers to do what they love to do, right? And so it's a struggle having, it's a balance trying to figure that out. And uh, we talk about freedom in software, that's what really open source is, is to have the freedom. But we forget that that crea creates a free market, right? And just like uh, in a free market, there's, uh, the market will dictate what companies survive and what doesn't in the same way uh, it'll dictate what projects in the open source community survive and who don't. And so, and then until somebody comes around and says, hey, you made a mistake, let me fix that mistake for you, bring everybody over here and lock everybody in, like Amazon. So it sounds like we're all in agreement in the panel that open source is awesome. That's the way to go. And it sounds like we are, we're, we're having a, the, the, a little bit of a different perspective of what it means. It means, means to operate their open source business and provide open source products. So I'm going to maybe build on top of what Alex mentioned and maybe it took it at, at, at that question from a user's perspective. So if I'm a consumer of a certain technology or I'm using a certain product and it works well for me, but it, you know, it breaks at a certain point in time, I should be able to look into the code and understand how it works, and then I'd be able to understand maybe fix it for me, and maybe I can contribute that part to the core, to the to the to the to the where, to the location where the project lives, so everyone could gain from from that knowledge that I've just gained. So I think it's also important to look at that from a user's perspective and the benefits that the users get from an open source project. So I think eventually the the choice of going open source or not is is. Then, uh, at the very end, it's mostly like a business choice, right? Whether you want to, like, it really changes them from people. Like, the reason I would go to open source is not the same reason as Alex would go to open source. He's a businessman. I'm, I'm a developer. I think with a different uh, mindset. Um, so the reason I would go to open source is mostly because I want to give back to the community. But I don't, I don't entirely agree with you and say um, that open source enables for standards to be created. I think the community that around the open source project actually enables the standards to be created. Is, the, is empowering this community and these humans that are part of these open source projects to actually um, make choices and decide what's going on is what, that is what makes, is what's making the standards actually. So one thing we, we, all, we often forget is that technology is, is social before it is actually technology. And I, at this, like I didn't create this, this is actually something that um, Gil Zalus said before, and I'm actually quoting him. So we often forget that, and, and it is empowering people to, to actually be part of these changes that is making open source what it is today, and that is actually helping creating all these standards that we, we like and we all um, worship. Fantastic. I'm gonna ask some uh, targeted questions at each of Mario, if that's okay. Uh, so Christian, you have quite a track record when it comes to working with large-scale organizations and bringing in open source into these organizations. What kind of uh, struggles have you seen in those kind of uh, scenarios, like with Tapjoy? What has it taken to get them to adopt open source versus other options out there? Yeah, so it, it all depends on the DNA of the company. Um, a lot of times companies who are born digital and already had a, a digital or online strategy uh, for their revenue uh, generating model, uh, they're much easier to work with because the, 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 com the DNA was from day one, the engineers introduced open source. Uh, I mean, 90% of the internet is run by Linux, not Microsoft or closed source, uh, at least active sites according to Netcraft. Um, but, uh, it, so it's a lot easier to work with companies who have uh, been in that uh, arena of the dig digital DNA. But uh, a more established company or even a brick and mortar who's moving online or uh, a Fortune 500 who has uh, you know, a mix of both. Those are a lot more difficult. You know, um, if anybody's have to uh, has had to ever sit in front of uh, a legal board of lawyers because you're introducing, you know, SSH into the company, uh, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, and so it's a, it's very it can get uh, cumbersome unnecessarily just because they're afraid of what they don't know. And so it, it, it's trying to lead them there. So that is changing very rapidly. We see a lot of uh, large companies here at this conference. And so it, it's, a, it's a good change in the right direction, but it still takes a lot of uh, hand-holding. Thank you. Um, Alex, Marantis took the distro approach, um, which is, can be uh, competitive. How do you differentiate yourself? Um, and what have you learned like in this whole kind of business model? Well, so Marantis is a pragmatic company, right? So we 
we take an industry and we try to find a way to traverse it so that we can build a business as we're doing this. So we started first by actually being a professional services company and we helped the early adopters to build OpenStack clouds because we had people who knew OpenStack. Then we recognized that there is a certain set of problems that could be automated so we don't have to do it repeatedly again through a distro and we built a distro business and we kind of replicated the Red Hat model. Um, and um, after a while, we've recognized that our friends or nemesis is, depending how you want to define them, in, in, uh, <laughs> um, in um, um, Seattle, have uh, actually created a concept of a cloud, right? And OpenStack was, uh, you know, response to that concept, you know, the, of AWS. But there is something else that AWS has done that is actually very, very useful. Uh, they have evangelized and as a service model as very successful when you go and sell it into an enterprise. And uh, those of us who've been selling to enterprise recognize that nobody expected for AWS to make such a huge inroads into traditional enterprises as they have in the last two years and has been extremely disruptive for the traditional infrastructure players, both in hardware and software and the like. So because of that, the as-a-service or SaaS-like business model for infrastructure consumption has become somewhat of a beginning of a standard that wasn't even a possibility two years ago. So Mirantis, those of you who follow us, have recognized that it's very difficult to actually build a successful cloud through a distro approach and integration approach it takes years and millions of dollars, whereas an as-a-service could be done in a matter of weeks because this is really where the world is going. So as a next step of evolution, we created a, um, I mean, it's still a distro, but it's an operator-centric distro that can be either managed by a more sophisticated customers or by us as a managed service. So we're taking the business model pioneered in infrastructure by Amazon and taking it disattached to Amazon stack and disattached to an Amazon data center to the world through an open source world, right? So that's what we're doing and this is actually accelerating our business probably 10x compared to where it's been even a year ago. Thank you. You actually touched on something I want to ask later, um, so I'll come back to that, but about yeah, kind of the trend around open core and uh, SaaS models, but uh, we'll come back to that. Uh, Monty, uh, you've made your way around different companies, ones that are known for ah. their more proprietary code, um, and it's uh, it, they have completely different uh, models, and I've I just been wondering, like, what do you... How do you feel about like kind of moving from uh, those companies to you know a more open model, the kind of the flagship open source company, and how how is the disparate models? How do they work together? How do they compare? This that is, wasn't uh, the best uh, formed question. Yeah, I apologize. That's, that's, that's great. This is this is going to be tricky because I, I don't I don't really I don't really want to speak ill of of any of the previous places. So let me see if I can. I can uh, actually answer the, the 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 thing without doing you, that you too badly. You can do a Boris. Yeah, I, I'll try and be a. <laughs> There's no way I can do a Boris. <laughs> Where's Boris? Boris can come in and do a Boris. Um, it can break glass. Uh, so 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 first of all, I I, I will say it's it's uh, uh, you know being at Red Hat the last year has has been has been uh, honestly uh, really fantastic. Uh, if, if for no other reason than um, I'm I'm no longer the the kind of one of the voices of in the corner trying to teach everybody else how to how to do open source. Uh, turns out the company I'm in now is pretty good at that. Um, so I don't I don't have to teach anybody crap, um, <laughs> which is which is a real load of. I can I can focus on other things. I don't have to you know uh, uh, try and go and do that uh, that evangelism um, side, uh, which is really nice. Um, on on the uh, you know which which sort of points to. The previously one of the one of the big challenges there, and this is a challenge that um, that it, it was it was it was worthwhile and it, it felt you know felt good for a period of time. And it's it's hard, but um, but worthy to to try and tackle is you have you have these companies that have been around for for a long time and have been you know successful doing doing their businesses, and now the the world is the world is changing. The world is 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 moving. There's a there's a there's new ways of of thinking, and and you've got in all of those companies really. Really great engineers, really, really great, you know, uh, you know, sort of people all across the organization that, that honestly want to uh, to to em embrace things. They want to they want to learn things. They want to they want to move and change 
uh, with the times. Sometimes it's really hard to do that because of inertia. You know, sometimes you just you've been doing things a, 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 a away for a while and um, and that. But not just as as people that are attempting to be vendors in the open source space, but this same the same pattern is is out there for all of the all the companies we're selling to, all the companies that are that are customers. You've you've got people that are focused on on their business, and all of a sudden they've got this open source thing they've got to they've got to deal with, and they've got DevOps, and they've got cloud, and they've got you know who knows what tomorrow. You know, and I'm trying Container, to figure out how serverless. Yeah, serverless. <laughs> you know, we're all figuring out where the servers went. You know, um, <laughs> and uh, so um, so so there's. The, the the those same challenges e exist and, and so so in a lot of ways it, it's really just a, a, a microcosm of the of the industry as a whole how do you how do you go in and talk to people about not just not just open source but what does that mean to their business what is it what are the changes that, that that's going to require out of them and how does that affect um, you know how, how does that affect all those things and that can be that can be scary it can be hard sometimes people do a really good job with it right and sometimes uh, sometimes the efforts they do will fail for the same reasons that other things. Sometimes they'll be wildly successful. Like, um, uh, but but certainly if we don't engage and if we don't if we don't try and move that needle forward, then it's certainly never going to get anywhere. So you know, I think that on the one hand, it's really great to be at a at a company that's already there, um, and on the other hand, it's been it's been a fun challenge. You know, over the over the years leading up, um, being uh, being part of, of of working with people on. On getting better and on transforming and on, on meeting their goals to do that, you know, it's not necessarily coming in and telling them they have to do something. It's they're like, hey, come come work with us on on doing this. So it's the, you know, that's some good stuff. Awesome. I'm gonna target the next question at Flavio, but you probably have uh, a few things to say about it too. But uh, oh, no. what's it really like being a maintainer of an open source project? Uh, How much time the complexity, do you have? Yeah. <laughs> uh, what are the true complexities and? How do you see that affecting actually the uh, you know the monetization and business aspects? Sure. Also, if you have any insight on that. Uh, yeah. So no, really. How much time do you have? Um, that is, um, that is, <laughs> Not that is, much because the answer is Well, I mean, that, that is the first question you got. <laughs> that, is, that is the first question you got to ask to every open source maintainer, um, regardless whether they're being paid for that or not. Um, it takes a lot of time to maintain an open source project and. If we're talking about open source projects that are the size of OpenStack, it takes even more time because you don't only have to deal with the code, you also have to deal uh, with a bigger community and you have to talk to people. Um, a former boss of mine used to say that open source is like 90% talking and 10% coding, and she's like, not really far from the truth. Uh, and then there's a lot of frustration in there, uh, tons of frustration in there, um, not only for the code, also but for the community. So when it comes to money meditation is um, how much you care about the community, how much you care about the project. It's not all about the money. It's, all, it's, a, it's about how you invest your time, and that is what really is going to help you monetize at the very end of the day what you're actually coding on. Um, so if you, if you know how to invest your time, if you know how to dedicate your time on and how to improve your own community, and I always go back to community because community means a lot to me, and I really believe that you know, open source projects are mostly about a community, not so much about the code. Sure, I mean, if it doesn't work, well, what the heck, you know, no, just go back home and, and, and chill, I guess, or cry, but, um, but yeah, I mean, at the very end is, is, is how you invest your time is really, is, is the real investment, and then, of course, money is important, but um, that's what really- Minorly important. Yeah. No, it's just it's <laughs> the little thing that just pays our salaries, but, uh, but yeah, yeah, I guess that's it, right? And I actually do want to want to just uh, think. Fabio said, you know, it gets frust It can get really frustrating, and one of the reasons is that usually when you're when you're leading one of these things or you're you're really involved in it, you you deeply want it to be successful, and so right. you get really emotionally tied up in that. And then it can be, you know, when you when when there's when there's other things that are that are causing that to maybe not. Like, yeah, exactly. Like so that's it's, what it's out of. It's like this thing out of love, right? Like that is exactly yeah. what I said. Regardless, you're being paid for this or not, it yeah. just becomes your baby, and it's like you want, you just want it. To, you just want to see it shine, and you want to see yeah. people using it because you're investing time and thoughts on it. I'm not gonna give you the mic, Captain. No. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna tell you one last question at Arthur. I have two last questions that I think are important. I want to ask them, so we're gonna have to keep our next answers a little bit shorter. If that's okay, uh, I just so to build Arthur, uh, Cloudify started with the regular open source uh, model, and then uh, with Apache Aria, and moved to an open governance model. Um, you know, what have you learned 
uh, with that, and can you share a little bit of background about this move, why it was important, and how it differentiates you know, the open source versus open governance? Sure. So, as you all probably know, Clarify is in the orchestration business, building an orchestration product, also an open source product. But it's, you know, we also have competitors who are also doing orchestration, right? And some of us are focusing on the task elements of it, right? How do you, how do you interpret a certain, uh, a certain uh, definition of an application? How do you do the orchestration, like the core fundamental thing of orchestration? And kind of to think about it, you know, so it's, it's kind of like very similar to what operating systems are doing. So in operating system, system space, you have, you know, various distros that are sort of fighting over the, 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 the mind and, and heart of users. But in the fundamental, you know, core of it, you always have the kernel, which is the same. So essentially, you know, the applications run in a similar way, but you have different ways to package them, distribute them, and you have also all sorts of, you know, uh, sugaring around the different distros that sort of attaching the users. So again, from that perspective, you know, we started uh, the project Aria, and the idea there is to create this community of developers who would have the same goal in mind, right? It's all about collaborating the right things we should collaborate around. It's not about, you know, the, the language itself, the, the, the Tosca uh, specification itself is the same. We shouldn't fight over who has the best parser or has, you know, a certain set of code base that, that that, that does that small, you know, sort of small and identical thing around us, whether, whether we should compete around unique features within our product. So in that sense, very similar to what we're doing with, with the operating system market space. So. Very interesting. Okay, so uh, since uh, I have two questions that are pretty long, uh, I'm going to ask just uh, some of you to answer them. I hope that's okay. Um, so, you know, the Red Hat model has been the, you know, frame of reference until, uh, today for open source, uh, you know, business models, but there have been other models, you know, like Hadoop and Android and Mongo have taken other approaches. Um, Alex, is there a winning business model in your opinion? Well, I am, I think that um, there can only be one true Red Hat. And, uh, you know, it's been said before, I think Peter Levine um, from um, Andreessen Horowitz wrote an article about it that uh, um, you know Red Hat stuff is all completely open source and yet they're monetizing it the same way that uh, uh, enterprise vendors are doing and they're really you can using the stitching approach and the you know compliance approach so uh, Red Hat has been has done an amazing job and I don't know that anybody else can repeat that by essentially taking open source and creating an appearance in the go-to-market that's very similar to any enterprise software. I think this model outside of Red Hat will not work, and those of you who are thinking of startups and all, I suggest you don't go that route. Um, <laughs> you know, we tried. It's a difficult route. I do think that the business model that will work is as a service business model because of the speed of innovation, and it's the same um, as uh, what we've seen, you know, 20 years ago happening in software where on-prem got completely replaced by SaaS and unless you're, you know, software and if you're in the SaaS model, you're not even taken seriously for the most part. So, so in, in open source, uh, if you're trying to lock it in so people pay you for the bits, you know, be it support or whatever, you're kind of defeating the purpose. But if you're actually using open source to come up with an outcome, that people want to consume with an SLA, people will pay you money for that. And then the value of having open source underneath is actually great because you don't have to pay licenses and with all, all those things. So you're consuming innovation at the lowest cost and you're providing an outcome. And that business model, if it can be properly harnessed, will work in the open source community more and more. Christian, what are your thoughts? So um, essentially what it, uh, companies like Amazon who are successful with they're selling is convenience. That's their product. Technology is just, is just a vehicle for that. And what you're, it piggybacks on what you're saying. It's, it's they're expecting an outcome. And that, and a lot of times that is convenience. Solve this problem. Solve these multi-AZ replication situations for us. Um, and we don't have to wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning. That's the convenience that they sell. So any successful open source model has to have a, a factor of convenience and most of us got that wrong, and that's why Amazon owns such a large percentage of the cloud market right now. Okay, so I'll continue and ask, what, what suggestions do you have for OpenStack in this context? Uh, convenience. Focus on, you know, you know, what does Horizon have to be, for example, so complicated? Why don't we take the approach of uh, UI, UX, and, and put that in there? Uh, my team is actually, has that as an initiative to help improve Horizon. Uh, and give it back to the community. 
but there's so many um, um, so many uh, scenarios where you know how do we get this to, how do we try OpenStack within like 30 minutes uh, there's there's few places where they're hard to find and so we want to make we want to improve that for OpenStack okay um, so on that note, do you think that uh, an open source project can survive without a strong powerhouse driving it or a benevolent dictator? I mean, OpenStack adopted the foundation model and the whole, uh, you know, kind of distributed, in a sense, uh, governance uh, model. And what are your thoughts on that? No, I, I, that's actually one of the things that I think, is, I know there's people that disagree and they're wrong and that's okay. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I think that's one of, one of our, one of our, our strengths in, in OpenStack is um, it, uh, the the quote's been going around the the Twitters over the last couple of months, uh, but but I, I think it speaks to this uh, really well. Is that you know if you want to if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. Um, and uh, any time you've got that that sort of single single person, that's a, that's a bottleneck. Like that's not actually that that may be that may help you accelerate something for 30 seconds or something like that. But that's not a that's not a long term strategy. That's not that's not how an ecosystem can can build and grow. If you think about the world's most successful piece of open source software, the internet, um, <laughs> uh, that's that's a that is a that is a thing that has been under a, a portion. It's distributed governance because it's distributed pieces of things. It, it is it is run by lots of different people by consensus, right? It works because different people run pieces of it independently, and it all works the same, right? Um, so that's that's the thing that if you really want something to to last, if you really want it to matter, um, it it can't just be tied to one person's revenue stream, or one person's ability to not get hit by a bus, uh, you know, or or any of those things. And and so I think that's that's absolutely essential for the long term health of anything. Can I make a 10 second comment to this? Yes. Because this is very Claudio important. Claudio also wants to say something. So in 2011, when we committed to OpenStack. Everybody thought we were crazy because technologically it was probably the worst of the projects. It was very early and 10% of our engineers quit when we announced that because their management was incompetent. The reason we did that is exactly for the, what, the reason that Monty said there wasn't a, there wasn't a powerhouse controlling 80% of it. CloudStack was a much better product Citrix. and Citrix controlled it. Yeah. and. It died, died for the reasons that Monty has suggested, and we're going strong. And initially, its usability so was So for industry-sized projects, you cannot have anybody controlling it. Yeah. Flavio, yeah, you so, had a... Yeah, I just wanted to add more to um, what Monty said, for, but from a different perspective, despite my, um, besides my dislike, deep dislike of any kind of dictator ever, <laughs> um, I'll, um, I'll add that having that fear there that will eventually make every call for the community, regardless whether it's like single point of failure or not, I think it kills innovation to some extent and the ability for people to actually motivate themselves to actually make the community better because eventually it'll all come down to whether this person wants to do stuff or not. And I think that uh, from a human perspective, that really hits everyone, um, even, even without people actually noticing it. And I'm not gonna say that they're not successful communities with benevolent dictators, like if you look at the Python community, it, it, Python has gone somewhere. Um, <laughs> we can say that it's been long, um, it's been around long enough, but I do think it's not, if you compare uh, the evolution of Python, um, although it's a very different technology from OpenStack, but if you compare the evolution of Python uh, to OpenStack on the way the community has grown, let alone the technology itself, but the community itself, you can, you can see how fast the OpenStack community has gone, how strong the OpenStack community is in comparison to the Python community and how much we can be more, like, I guess, united in comparison to, to how the Python community works. So, yes, I, no, no dictators ever. We're nearly out of time, but I have one really good question left. So can we have a tiny bit of overflow? Tiny bit. Just um, okay. So. A lot of uh, open source companies are going with the kind of SaaS approach you were talking about that, um, leading kind of to more of an open core model than uh, open source. Is that a new trend? How do you think that's going to affect open source? Ultimately, everybody gets 30 seconds. <laughs> and we're starting with you. Go, Christian. Um, yeah, open, it, that's not a new concept. I've seen it around for you know, almost 20 years. And so it, 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 that's the thinking. Uh, unfortunately, engineers, we don't think always as business people, but it's like, how am I going to continue to do what I love and make money off of it? And so 
modularizing and microservices today are great because now we're, we're thinking of non-monolithic uh, approaches to put everything in one uh, package and hope for the best and uh, now you can actually strip certain areas um, and you know put the areas, uh, the modularize the areas that the enterprise wants so that you could sell it to them and, uh, and give it to people, uh, give the rest of the world. And th these are uh, the, the ways that you can protect your product, your core. Uh, you know, use like the AGPL is the most strictest or uh, safest uh, way to uh, publish your product, but that license is also, there's legal implications. Uh, go ahead, Alex actually had a, a, go ahead, Arthur and then Alex, go ahead, Arthur. Yeah, so to me, just, you know, how, you know, you know just to piggyback on the, you know, the, the entrepreneurial perspective, so, it's awesome that we love to build open source products and, and projects and we understand that you know, the community ha would, will give the velocity for even a smaller company. If you, if you get to the community, obviously the product will go and, 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 and make you know, progress much faster, but how do you like, make a sustainable business out of it if you're giving away most of it free? So do you close certain features or, or do you provide only support for that? Do you provide only services around that? Do you piggyback on some maybe bigger house that would do marketing for you, for example, right? I'm a smaller company producing open source project, but hey, Amazon, you know, provides that in a service. Suddenly, I have much more awareness of, of, of the product that I'm building. So maybe that's, a, that, that's, a, that's a, the, the, the positive side of, of being, you know, part of the Amazon ecosystem. So it's, it's all about sustainability of the business and being, being able to actually pay those, those salaries for developers. Alex? So the open core system business model has its merits. And a good example is Cloudera just went public. And um, when you do comparisons apples to apples, they're valued at 2x the um, Hortonworks, if not more, right? And they have a lot of proprietary stuff. The trick is, what do you keep open and what do you keep proprietary? So whatever concern, in, in our case, whatever you have by way of a platform, you can never have an additional feature in a platform that is suddenly proprietary because you'll get disrupted and locked in and won't work. However, you can have areas around the platform, for example, compliance which is specific to automotive industry and plugging into their compliance system. That's a very important part for somebody to run Hadoop if you're an automotive provider. You will pay a million dollars for that compliance thing and there's no reason to open source it. So have that as an add-on. and. And that's, you know, these kind of examples could be made into a business model. But don't try to take the actual Hadoop thing, put something in, 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 inside, and say, well, it's better, I'll make it proprietary. That won't work. It's, it's worth pointing out really briefly that uh, there was an attempt at an open core cloud company that predates uh, OpenStack, and OpenStack exists largely because Eucalyptus decided to take the open core approach. Um, uh, so uh, that, that sh I'll just let that be uh, my thoughts on its your closing open thought, source. Your closing thought. I have so many more questions, but we're out of time. Uh, the insight has been exceptional. Um, folks, you can totally talk to these uh, experts uh, if you're considering launching an open source project, get some insight on some of the mistakes that have been made, some of the uh, th lessons that have been learned, and uh, how to really... Uh, have success with open source projects so that they thrive and continue kind of to drive innovation. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks, John. Thank you.